All right, so section 3.3, three, we're going to find zeros and factors of polynomial functions. Um, we have found zeros and factors before, but now we're going to find all of them. So this is going to include, um, include irrational numbers like square roots. Like square root 5 and imaginary numbers. So we've done this before, but we were only doing real numbers. So, and long division or synthetic division is what's going to allow us to find them all. Um, so let's review what a complex number is again, just in case it's been a while. Um, those are numbers with i's in them, right? They look like a plus bi, where i squared is negative 1, or i is the square root of negative 1. And then any time a plus bi is a 0, then its conjugate is also a 0. Um, when we have a polynomial with real coefficients. So that's helpful. That'll help us find zeros when we get into them. So let's find zeros of x squared plus 9. Um, so we're going to set it equal to 0. Uh, this doesn't factor, right? We can factor difference of squares, but we can't factor sums of squares. Um, so I'm just, you could use the quadratic formula, or since there's no x term, we can just uh, move the negative 9 to the other side and square root. So we get absolute value of x equals the square root of negative 9, which is how we get x equals plus or minus square root of negative 9. Right? The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Uh, and then the square root of negative 9 is the square root of negative 1 times 9. And so that's how we get 3i plus or minus 3i. And so the i's, right, those are conjugates. So we have positive 3i and negative 3i. So the, they always go in pairs. So those are our zeros. Um, if you wanted to factor this, what we're going to get into in a second is it's going to look like x plus 3i, x minus 3i. So we're going to do these new factors with i's and square roots. But we'll see that in a second. So the rule for factors, the reason I came up with that is if c is a 0, then x minus c is a factor, and vice versa. So if x minus c is a factor, then we also know that c is a 0. We've been talking about this for a couple sections, but now we can include imaginary numbers as well. So let's see what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do is maybe we know one factor, and that can help us find the remaining factors. Um, Long division will help us with that. Um, let's actually just check if something is a factor by using this theorem. So if x minus 1 is a factor, right, then 1 is a 0. That's what the theorem tells me. Right? If 1 is a 0, then x minus 1 is a factor, or if x minus 1 is a factor, then x equals 1 is a 0. And the if and only if is what's telling me I can go in either direction, and it's still true. So I could use long division and check if I get no remainder, but I could also use this theorem. So if it's a 0, I should be able to plug in, neg I should be able to plug in 1, and I should get 0. So we get 2, we get plus 3, minus 5, plus 7. What's that? 5 minus 5 plus 7, which is 7, which is not 0. So x equals 1 is not a 0, which also means x plus minus 1 is not a factor. The two go hand in hand. It has to be both. And that also goes back to the remainder, right? When we had a remainder of 0, it was a factor because there's no remainder. And so it's a similar idea. So this would have a remainder of 7 if you remember the remainder theorem. Right? If we have a remainder, something is not a factor.
So let's do one more theorem and some examples. So this can also tell us the number of zeros. So there's two theorems we're going to use. Um, a polynomial function of degree n greater than zero always has at least one zero. Um, so it may be complex, it may be irrational, but it always will have at least one zero. So it doesn't have to be a nice zero, but there is at least one. And then the complete factorization theorem tells us that um, we have, if we find all the zeros, there could be n of them, but they might all be the same. So not distinct means they might be repeats. And that goes back to the multiplicity. But there should be n of them, n factors, um, but we might have repeats. And so we can always rewrite it as a product of n factors. Again, these might be complex or irrational, so it's not going to be the traditional factoring that we're used to but we're always able to do this. So what does this theorem tell us? It tells us, just to kind of summarize it, that we have at least one zero for all polynomials, but we could have up to n different zeros. Um, so there will be n factors. There's always n of these, but some of them might be repeats. So let's find a polynomial, a cubic polynomial with real coefficients that has zeros x equals 2 and x equals i plus 1. So what that theorem tells me is it's degree 3, so we have three factors. So f of x will be a n, x minus c1, x minus c2, and x minus c3 for degree 3. So what are we have to figure them out. Um, so we know one of them is 2. And we know one of them is i plus 1. So that means we're missing one of the zeros. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the chapter, it's the conjugate. So if x equals 1 plus i is a 0, so is the conjugate x equals 1 minus i. So we get to do some fun multiplication right now. So f of x equals a sub n. That's just a coefficient. It can be any number, actually. And we'll get x minus 2, x minus 1 plus i, and x minus 1 minus i. I'm just going to distribute the negative, and then we can start multiplying this out. x minus 1 minus i, x minus 1 plus i. So we have to be extra careful with all these negative signs right now. So make sure you put parentheses on those conjugates, on those imaginary or the complex zeros. So let's go ahead and multiply this out. So anytime there's more than two terms, I like to make boxes. So I'm going to do these two first. So we're going to do x minus 1 minus i, x minus 1 plus i. And since it's 3 by 3, we get nine boxes. And we multiply. So if you've never done my method, x times x is x squared. x times negative 1 is minus x. I'm just multiplying minus ix minus x. I really like this because if you try to do it by without the boxes, it's really easy to miss a term, especially once there's more than 2. Negative 1 and negative 1 is 1. Negative 1 and i is positive i. x and i would be ix. We get minus i, and then we get negative i squared. So let's go ahead and simplify this. Um, so let's see. ix and negative ix cancel out. That's good. The i's cancel out. And then negative i squared would be negative negative 1. The definition of i squared is negative 1. That's something we want to know. It'll pop up a lot. So this last piece is just a 1. Cool, so let's figure this out. So this would be x squared minus 2x plus 2. And then we'll multiply that by x minus 2. And I'll make boxes one more time. So this one will be x squared minus 2x plus 2, x minus 2. So this one's only six boxes because it's 2 by 3. 
So we get x cubed minus 2x squared, 2x minus 2x squared, 4x, and then we get minus 4. And so then we just get an, and then all this. We get x cubed, and then we get minus 4x squared, 6x minus 4. And so this would be an example of a polynomial um, with real coefficients. Um, all these coefficients are real numbers. There's no i's in there. Um, and it has those three zeros that we talked about. 2, 1 plus i and one minus i. And then an can be anything. You could make it five, you could make it two, you could make it one. Um, I'm just gonna make it one, because that's easy. So f of x is x cubed minus four x squared plus six x minus four. But this is not the only solution, this is a solution. Right, if I change this to five, 100, three, they all have the same zeros, because the constant out front doesn't affect the zeros. Cool, so I'll see you in the next video. Um, I highly recommend making tables when you start multiplying these more complicated things. Um, yeah, so see you in the next one.